Okay, so let's talk about the implications of what we've been working on so far. If we go back to the 17th century, then we have seen that both Descartes and Herbert can be seen as representing two aspects of Aristotle's thought. The a priori and the a posteriori. Part of the shift which occurs is an idealism and rationalism on the one hand and various forms of empiricism on the other. In a conversation with another student, it's almost as though there is, we can think about this as another split, because on the one hand, we end up with the more hardcore empiricists <clears throat> but we also end up with deism and natural theology so if we look at these more closely We only know what we perceive. As we've said, by the time we get to the 20th century, this reduces all meaning to the grammar and syntax of a language. <clears throat> if we look at this in terms of what is referred to as moral discourse. Determining what is good comes down to what do we mean when we say X is good. <clears throat> so, hang on a second. Hello. Yes, sir, how can I help you? Uh, look, look, no loans, no debt, we're good. Don't call again. Okay, what do you want? Really quickly, I'm in a meeting. What do you want? <clears throat> 
Okay, you have my email address. Email me the details. I'll look at it, okay? Okay, you can send it to inquiries at nygghtfalcon.com, okay? All right. The assumption is that there is a kind of objectivity in language. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. The problem There's an assumption that grammar and syntax are in some way objective. Or if they're not objective in and of themselves, they provide some kind of an objective framework. So the question becomes, is this true? And the answer is really no. All languages have common elements. For example, verbs, nouns, but in the end, all the rules become language specific. <clears throat> so for example, in German, all the questions, I'm sorry, all the verbs go at the end of the sentence. And then we run into paradoxes or situations like Hebrew has no verb to be. So in the end, they are specific to a given language, not universal. <clears throat> and there's no guarantee that the meaning will move from one language to another. That's why we spend a lot of time talking about context and connotation. Oh, is my book bag in the way? Okay. Hi, Diana. Hi. Is that better? Okay, so in the end, we're left with meaning specific to a given language. That assumes that all meaning can be reduced clearly and objectively down to a discussion of grammar and syntax. The other problem that's left open What I intend may not be what you intend. And our use of language is further 
influenced by the sphere of our experience. How I understood some words at the age of 20 was not how I understood the words at 40. <clears throat> so in the end, we're right back to the problem. We don't really know. By the way, we can also to this add slang, language that might be specific to a socioeconomic group. Example, we used to say, I'm up for that. Now we say, I'm down for that. Okay, any questions so far? All right. So if we go back to an analogy or a metaphor that we've used before, it's interesting that when Hume looks at this analogy, He's going to conclude that the best that we can do is infer that a creator existed. But about the creator, we can't say anything. Deism and natural theology are going to, to take a completely different perspective. And the question will become, is it logical or is it part of the fallacy of undue necessity? Uh -huh. So the argument essentially says <clears throat> to observe the world is to observe that it is ordered and structured. There are two options. That order is either intentional or accidental. And here, we're right back to Descartes. Because the idea that it would be accidental is dismissed as absurd. So the only option is that it's intentional. <clears throat> if it's intentional, It implies a designer. And it also implies that there is some kind of logic to it all. So This typically transitions to the question, and what does creation tell us about the designer? 
<clears throat> We're back to Descartes again. Because implied in this is the idea that the scope and detail far exceeds the scope of a human mind. So the designer or creator can't be human. So when we look at creation, the only conclusion we can come to is that God exists. <clears throat> This leads us to a deeper question. What was God's motivation for creation? And the answer becomes that the whole of the universe is intended for us to know God. If we think about the implications of what this means, if we go back to our conversation about Herbert, we said that Herbert claimed two things were invalid, revelation through scripture and systematic theology. So in some sense, the genius of deism and natural theology is that it transfers revelation from scripture to nature. <clears throat> and it transfers systematic theology to a kind of natural science if we look at the world, we can come to the same conclusion we would have come through, either by reading scripture or through systematic theology. Okay, let me stop there for a second. What do we think? Any questions so far? Okay, Deanna, is this helping tie pieces together? <clears throat> okay. So, at this point, if we go back and look at um, Descartes, when we talk about Leibniz and Spinoza, we end up with a kind of dualism where there is the world of idea and there is the physical world. The world of ideas is often linked, I think incorrectly, to Plato's theory of forms. And the idea is that a form 
is a perfect idea, <clears throat> which will be embodied in an object and an object in the world is an imperfect embodiment of an idea. <clears throat> On the one hand, it will produce a very clear idea of the good. There's no debate about that. because we can establish a kind of hierarchy of ideas and we link the presence of ideas to the infinite God, just as did Descartes. <clears throat> okay. Questions? Making sense? Okay. There's a huge gap, obviously, between these two positions. When we look at the beginning of utilitarianism, there is a kind of transfer of a hierarchy of ideas down to down to one aristotle's concept of happiness that is what humans long for <clears throat> and when we talk about happiness We want to keep in mind, number one, that it is linked to a concept of fulfillment. And number two, the Latin phrase is media ray, <coughs> the middle of the road. Aristotle does not in and of himself rule out physical pleasures but any extreme becomes unacceptable. And in terms of fulfillment, he talks about the concept of practice, habit. We hone our skill as a blacksmith over time. And virtue is inseparable from the practice of a habit. <clears throat> but by the time that we hit the 18th century, the fundamental meaning of some of these terms has changed. For example, because of the impact of Christianity, we are less likely to indulge or to see physical pleasure as good. So Aristotle's concept of engaging the world in moderation shifts to a concept of virtue, which is much more like that of Descartes than the original intention of Aristotle. 
sau. Utilitarianism becomes a kind of attempt to reframe Aristotle in a kind of Aristotelian Christian paradigm. <clears throat> so the concept of the greatest good for the greatest number is the result of that modification. It presupposes Aristotle, Christianity, and to a lesser extent, all of the social development Because now we're in 1725, Aristotle's been dead for about 2200 years. How they understand the greatest good for the greatest number then becomes very different than technically how we're going to continue to see it and how this idea will change over time. <clears throat> Any questions so far? To some extent, this is largely reviewed just on a much more inclusive global scale. Is this helping? Okay. Diana, is it helping? Okay. So, when Hutchison and Gay began the development of utilitarianism. This is the context in which they're thinking. <clears throat> Recently, I've been also asking myself, did this apply to everyone? Or only the upper class. <clears throat> England is a highly stratified culture. There is virtually no middle class. <clears throat> the middle class that exists, exists over poverty, but not by a whole lot. And if you recall, Gay was a preacher slash, slash priest. Hutchison was trained along much the same line. And these are all men who went to Oxford and Cambridge, the high end of English society. So if this is the way it is in the 18th century, we shouldn't be too surprised that by the 19th, 17th century, 18th century, that by the 19th century, when this is mixed with social Darwinism, we begin to get a pretty bleak view of human culture. So <clears throat> between Hutchison and Gay and Jeremy Bentham, there's about a hundred years of debate. centering around the concept of good and greatest 
as you recall, the shift that occurs <coughs> at the end of the um, 18th into the 19th century is going to begin is going to be the confluence of the work of a number of people one of whom will be Bentham, Comte, Malthus, and Lamarck. We want to keep in mind that there is a second tradition sort of over to the side at the same time represented by Hegel in Germany. And while there are others working in tandem with him, not necessarily sharing his intellectual view of the world, When we look at these traditions together, we pretty much will see how the next 200 years will break out. I'm not sure that I can tell you why specifically Bentham decided on the greatest pleasure for the greatest number. <clears throat> and it might be something we want to look at <coughs> next week or the week after. But what's particularly interesting is going to be the way in which the confluence of these four men on the one hand Trigger Spencer Darwin Spencer reads Darwin, revises his theories and we get social Darwinism as we know <clears throat> but let's look more closely at Malthus for the moment. There is no scientific training so the question becomes how did he come to the conclusion that he reached what was the driving force what was he thinking Was this purely theoretical or was there some kind of objective research? <clears throat> From everything I've seen, it's much more theoretical. And the core of what he's saying does have some truth. One, there's a finite amount of land Two, a finite amount of food can be produced. Three, without some control, population will exceed food. <clears throat> 
<clears throat> and yes, by the way, we're temporarily leaving Kant out of this discussion. So on the one hand, this is all true. On the other hand, you can imagine the reaction in the 19th century <coughs> to the implications of Malthus's work. So we shouldn't be surprised that fear became a driving emotion. So if we put this in the context of the greatest good for the greatest number, or even in terms of Bentham, the reality becomes someone is going to have to make that decision. So, not surprisingly, <clears throat> social Darwinism is going to pick up on the class distinctions that are already present in English society. It also assumes again, at some level, that's true, all resources are scarce. But it also assumes that some humans are inherently more valuable. This takes us into what we've called the Darwinian triple helix. Humans against all life forms. and intrasocial. So as I'm working through this with you, if we go back to the turning point, We'll put a stick in the ground and we'll say that this is the year 1900. <clears throat> Keeping in mind that all of this is transpiring um, let's rephrase this. Let's make this 1800. <clears throat> 
Let's make this 1750 and 1850. We've mentioned him before, Charles Milton. Um, anyone remember <clears throat> what we said about him? He went to jail several times because he was an advocate for birth control. From what I can tell, his concern for women is, is legitimate. Is he a bit over emotional? Uh, yes, but that was not uncommon at this point. There are <clears throat> a lot of people making very impassioned arguments that are not necessarily logically sound. There's another sense in which Comte is being reappropriated. <clears throat> so if I can find a way to get this down here. Holyoke and humanism. If you recall what we've said about Holyoke in the past, his drive for social reform is in part a reaction to social Darwinism. but even more so a reaction against <coughs> the classism of England. You may recall the pivotal, pivotal point in his life, there were two actually, he was seven years old working on a lathe, which is a device, a machine that spins an object and you can make a circle out of a rectangle, for example. Um, he had a silk scarf on, and the silk scarf got caught in the lathe. The second was the death of his sister. His mother went to the church to pay her taxes and was delayed so much that his sister, who had tuberculosis, died without the mother being present. He's also influenced and significantly helped by the Unitarian Church. <clears throat> the Unitarian Church is a kind of, and I want to be careful about using this phrase, but I don't know of a better one, a kind of secular religious church. It essentially says, whatever you believe, that's fine. <clears throat> In the end, there's one God. Many ways to get there, but one God. Whether it was their intention or not, they became catalysts for change. So as I've mentioned to you before, the concept of Sunday school was invented by the Unitarian Church <clears throat> you literally, if you were from a poor family, went to church on Sunday to learn to read. And very few people ever learned to write. Holyoke did eventually at the age of 17. Unfortunately for everyone involved, his social reform, his humanism,
is coupled with the word atheism. Remember, <clears throat> we've also talked about the fact that if you wanted to go to Oxford, Cambridge, or any other school, you had to sign the 39 Articles of Faith. So church and state were one. And anything that bucked <coughs> the relationship between the church and the political and social elite would be branded as atheism. This is a time of massive social discontent in England. And following the end of yet another war with the French, the prime minister called out the army essentially to kill Englishmen who were rebelling against the cruelty they suffered. All right, any questions or thoughts? We okay? Okay, Deanna, you okay? Okay. I'm sorry? Well, the argument was that since it it did not rely specifically on theology. <clears throat> that's right. If we go back to Comte for a second, remember Comte says that there are three stages to religion. Mm -hmm. The last stage is positivism. or the religion of humans. Right. So since there is no central body of theological reflection here, got to be atheism. That was the argument. <clears throat> um, Harriet Martineau That's a policy of begging the question. Mm -hmm. Harriet Martineau, who translated most of Comte's works into English from French, <coughs> became a staunch defender of Holyoke. And despite everything that she said, despite numerous debates that Holyoke and his supporters waged throughout England, they all went to jail for atheism. So, the more that I think about this, I'd like to propose the following. The split embodied in the work of Descartes and Herbert Deepens it would help if I spelled right <clears throat> and in some respects Kant's attempted synthesis wasn't enough to stop this. As a consequence of that, 
right. I'm not sure what just happened. Um, it may be that um, because I'm not connected to the internet, it lost itself. So there's growing pressure for social reform. Yeah, looks like I lost it. <clears throat> okay, up, oh, we're back. There's growing pressure for social reform. The established churches, Protestant and Catholic, become less and less effective because they have allied themselves with the power structure. Urbanization makes the growing sense of inequality even more intolerable. <clears throat> We know that in 1807, slavery ended in England. What I'm about to say, I can't yet prove. But if we think about, okay, when slavery ended, and this might be an area we want to look at more going down the road. I think we ran into a problem analogous to what we would run into in the United States later. If you recall our earlier conversation, we said that the Negro question or the Negro problem in England dates to, 15, to 1807. So we can argue that what happened in theory was that while slavery came to an end, the bottom fell out for poor whites. So the need for social reform made the social crisis even worse. It may also be no accident that At the same time, there is concern for the welfare of women. <clears throat> Up until this point, there isn't none. So when Knowlton and others begin to worry about the suffering of women, it's within the context of social problems that are becoming ever worse. <clears throat> Industrialization caused far more problems than it solved. So when the woman's question and the Negro question become prominent, it only serves to intensify both the split and the need for social Darwinism. <clears throat> 
while they wouldn't have formulated it this way in 1807, by 1910, it's very clearly called race suicide. So, in this context, utilitarianism doesn't serve to really solve the problem. And the crisis deepens. So, <clears throat> This is the framework within which we're going to ultimately get John Stuart Mill. One, a reaction to the perceived heavy-handed nature of government. For example, there is a growing resentment to having to sign the 39 articles before you go to college. <clears throat> Number two, There is a sense in which the need for individual liberty is the promise of urbanization. Remembering what we said about Aristotle in the world of ancient Greece, you are what your father did. That's no longer true. And in fact, if you think about the radical economic oppression, of the Industrial Revolution, then there is a kind of deep and desperate hope for a better life. what we will come to call upward mobility. So it's probably no accident that in 1844, millennialism <clears throat> is born and we begin to think about the end of the world. The world is so bad life is so bad, everything is so miserable, it's falling apart. And I'm alone. I'm alone. And because I'm alone, it's up to me to decide the future. What will I do? So to that extent, the principle of harm becomes my right to determine my fate. I think as we often see over the course of everything we've talked about this morning and in subsequent previous meetings, what John Stuart Mill might have meant is not ultimately what happened. So let's add one point to this and then let me talk about the implications of that. 
the function of government is to fix harm. The assumption I would believe that John Stuart Mill would see well, that would be that these are not necessarily mutually exclusive, but that some measure of balance can be reached. I think there's a kind of presupposition that there is still a sense of common good that's possible even in this world. <coughs> I think where Mill comes apart is the assumption that the social organizations that support a common good continue to exist. And in fact, if we think about the life of John Stuart Mill, all major English social structures are under attack. I shudder to use this word or this phrase, but to some extent, there is a real middle class in England now. And the consequence of that is that the upper class begins to lose control. Without a strong sense of common good, without social structures that reinforce the structure of human society, the world comes apart. So I think you could argue that by the time we get to 1900, there is a growing sense of alienation By the time we get to the end of the First World War, we have seen an entire generation of European men killed. And there is, during this period in the United States, a combination of both despair and hedonism. Um, you may remember the phrase, the Roaring Twenties. Once again, the United States, or actually for the first time in the 20th century, it'll happen again, <clears throat> at the end of the First World War, <clears throat> essentially the United States goes into a period of extreme wealth. And that will be destroyed by the Great Depression. So from a purely sociological perspective, there is a sense in which there is no option as traditional Western society comes apart at the seams for a variety of reasons. What ultimately will happen will be that the principle of harm my right to determine my fate will achieve primacy. Everything else has failed. Everything else has failed. All right, let me stop there. Um, questions making sense. Okay, Diana makes sense. Okay. So the balance that was assumed by John Stuart Mill, 
weakens over the first half of the 20th century. In addition to the devastation of World War I, we have World War II. And in some respects, World War II represents the end, another kind of bookmark. in the history of the West. With the Great Depression, the debate surrounding all the social problems that we faced from 1865 until 1929 come to an end. <clears throat> there is no conclusion to the Negro problem. There is no answer to the woman's question. And to make matters worse, as we've noted in a previous lecture, between 1900 in 1972, eugenics is in full force in the United States. At the end of the Second World War, we've now gone through roughly 15 years of death, destruction, and violence. If we think about Sartre versus Camus, his is the voice of despair. the rebellion of the 1960s is born in that rebellion. The problem is that by the time we get to 1960, What's left? Everything that we took for granted a hundred years earlier is dead. And even though T.S. Eliot wrote The Wasteland considerably earlier than 1960, that gross emptiness descends full bore. So it's made worse by the fact that the promise of the 1950s is juxtaposed against the reality of the 1960s. It all falls apart. And there is a sense in which we are living in a kind of post-apocalyptic reality. It's all been destroyed. And as we've talked about before, if MIT is right, by 2038, 80% of our population will not make enough money to survive. So if we look back at what we've talked about this morning, the first point is that the failure to heal the split, to come up with an effective alternative between Descartes and Herbert, ultimately led to the shredding of Western culture into multiple threads which are not reconcilable. <clears throat> 
the way in which Holyoke was handled in the 19th century set up a host of problems in the 20th. If you recall, we said that between World War I and World War II, in 1932, the first Humanist Manifesto failed to do anything. The founding of the World Council of Churches ultimately failed to do anything. The World Council of Churches attempt in 1956 to write a paper on social justice failed to address social justice. So in 2022, analogously, we are about where we were in the middle of the 19th century facing the same social issues with an intensity that is not diminished. Um, questions, thoughts before I take this in a slightly different way, or are you all burned out and need a break? Um, I'm not burned out, but we do need to get really Okay. All right. Um, any last questions before we disperse? Okay, I will edit and post this video.